Well, welcome to the IPI, the International Peace Institute. Uh, we're about 50 years young uh, here at the IPA, IPI, and we've got uh, lots of things to do uh, for the next 50 years as well. Uh, we see our mission statement as supporting the UN family. Uh, we do that formally, informally, and in any other manner which the UN so chooses. Uh, today, we're here at this important uh, gathering in uh, UN High Level Week uh, to debate uh, the future of multilateralism as it relates to the future of arms control uh, and uh, disarmament. And therefore, uh, we could think of uh, no two better speakers to join us than the most recent uh, president uh, of the General Assembly, Her Excellency Ms. Maria Fernanda espinoza Garces, uh, who I'll introduce uh, to the uh, podium in a minute. And also, um, a good friend, uh, Dr. Lucina Zerbo, who is uh, head of the Comprehensive Test Band Organization right over there in Vienna. Uh, and uh, I'm now told reliably that Lucina is a candidate to become the next head of the International Atomic Energy Agency. So um, good luck, my friend, good luck. Uh, we, the IPA, are perfectly neutral on all these questions, just that he happens to be a friend of mine. So, so uh, it's good to have you here with us. Uh, when we think of uh, the future of multilateralism, uh, we think uh, of the role it continues to play across the full domain of activity of uh, the UN system. Uh, and it's not just on terrorism, it's not just on combating climate change, uh, and it's not just humanitarian crises. It covers every field of human endeavor. And that's because after the last huge war we had as a planet, we decided it was better to work with each other rather than against each other. And that was where the modern spirit of multilateralism was born. And I, <clears throat> I would hope that the international community, 75 years later, continues to remind itself of that core reason uh, why we decided to form a multilateral order. Of course, multilateralism has historically been highly relevant to the evolution of the arms control, nuclear non-proliferation disarmament agenda. Uh, we will all remember here, uh, back in 1996, uh, the passage of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Uh, this was uh, an important achievement uh, for the UN system. Um, and it was the passage of that uh, treaty uh, and the subsequent signature and ratification process which gave birth to the CTBO, the organization uh, in Vienna, which Lucina now heads. And its work, uh, frankly, is highly important uh, for the future of the comprehensive nuclear test ban and the overall work of the international family of nations in nuclear non-proliferation. So I think the way we should best proceed today is to have our two principal speakers uh, give their own formal remarks against the question we've been set today, picking up the pieces in a fractured world, rebuilding trust in multilateralism for peace and security. Um, picking up the pieces is probably a premature topic, um, but something which is hovering closer and closer to reality, unfortunately, as we see what is happening in the whole uh, non-proliferation space around the world today, without naming any particular region or any particular state. So to begin proceedings, if I could ask the um, uh, most recent president of the 72nd, uh, 3rd General Assembly, sorry, uh, 73rd General Assembly, Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces to address us, uh, and then I'll have great pleasure in, in introducing to you Lucina Serbo. Maria. Thank you, thank you very, very much as always, Kevin. And um, thank you all for being here because uh, uh, I'm sure that you all face some security challenges to reach the building. There is so much movement uh, across the street and uh, I'm very also happy to recognize uh, so many familiar faces and, and, and friends here. So let me once again start by thanking the International Peace Institute and, and Kevin Rudd uh, it's uh, 
its chairman of the uh, board of directors and uh, dear Adam, and of course to pay my respects to uh, a dear friend, uh, Dr. Lassina Zerbor, the executive secretary of CTBTO. And uh, very happy to see that also that he's a candidate for AIEA and um, I wish you all, all the best. Uh, you have excelled as, uh, as the executive secretary of CTBTO. So whatever happens, we will be in good hands. So today, uh, basically, uh, the question of today is multilateralism and how, what are the connections um, with CTBT? But in general, I would say the connections with the disarmament agenda. And, and perhaps I would like to address three questions. Uh, first, uh, and the first question that I think that we have to ask our, ourselves is, why is that we feel so insecure today? Um, and why, especially if we do have an international architecture that has norms and laws and frameworks on practically every aspect of human life and the environment. And I think I, we have to accept the fact that we do live in a world of stress, of insecurity, of mistrust. And perhaps that, that's where the pieces that Kevin was at, uh, referring to, we can find these pieces that really conform uh, an atmosphere of insecurity and of lack of trust. And I have seen figures and numbers recently, and they don't look good. People around the world do feel insecure for different reasons. And I think that recently also security has taken new proportions, new dimensions. Uh, and, and the reason why we feel insecure is because we are witnessing the weakening of our social contract, of our international rules-based order the Paris Agreement, the trade rules, the human rights architecture, the hard-won disarmament accords, such as the GCPOA or the INF, it's all kind of falling apart. And perhaps now I have a little more freedom that because I am uh, the president of the previous <laughs> session of the General Assembly, but we are witnessing indeed a proliferation of conflicts and, uh, and we are also witnessing our lack of capacity to reach agreement through the existing international schemes, such as, for example, the UN Security Council. Um, it is not a secret to you all, but uh, we are also witnessing a climate emergency that is destroying countries, livelihoods, ecosystems at an unprecedented rate, and we are here across the street from, uh, I would say, the most powerful ever climate summit in terms of the number of heads of state and government. So and it is not only the climate crisis, it is hate speech, religious intolerance, xenophobia uh, that has caused uh, hundreds of deaths only this year. And uh, I cannot start by counting you know, the victims of Christchurch, of uh, Sri Lanka, of the synagogue in California, San Diego. And this is connected to some social unrest. If you look at the figures of unemployment, unemployment uh, is on the rise, but also the number of the working poor are also on the rise. Cybersecurity has become one of the main concerns in our countries, both north and south, east and west. Um, I think that the very definition of security has become a complex web of interconnected factors that brings together economic, social, environmental determinants. And at the same time, the international community was able to design in the midst of all of this uh, our sustainable development goals that perhaps are the most comprehensive and ambitious blueprint of our times. The challenge is now how to deliver, how to implement Agenda 2030, and especially when we are facing financial, technological challenges, but above all, I think we're also facing a deficit in political will, in global leadership, 
and international solidarity. And I want to address that. We are facing a deficit on international solidarity. And sustainable development and peace and security go hand in hand. I, I don't need to convince you of that because it is uh, um, you know, very easy to, to explain. And I think that they're both mutually reinforcing. So the first question why is why do we feel insecure and in what is the kind of world and international atmosphere that we're living in? The second question is in this um, environment of anxiety, of insecurity, of mistrust, uh, whether or not uh, the predictability, the trust on international law, uh, and um, if international law is trustworthy uh, and predictable, I think it's, it's a question that we should ask, we should ask ourselves, especially when we're looking about CTBT and, and other uh, very important disarmament um, instruments. If we look at the Paris Agreement, the Global Compact on Migration, the Human Rights Council, the WTO rules, the arm, uh, arms control instruments. And these are just few examples that I would like to mention in, in, in terms of saying uh, we are weakening uh, this capacity that we had to reach agreement on the fundamentals. And we are seeing long established international laws and multilateral practices which have delivered so much in the past uh, 40, uh, sorry, 73 years devalued and, and why? Because of geopolitical tensions, unilateralism, ad hocery on some decisions that are taken. And uh, we, we are seeing, and I have traveled the world this year, it, but what we see is uh, a growing disconnect between people, governments, and institutions. And, and I think that this is a very much, you know, a huge government uh, governance challenge that, that we have. I think that people out there, regular people in the street, they expect us to keep the promises that we have made through the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, but uh, you know, through the Paris Agreement, to, uh, through our disarmament commitments, and I think that uh, they are losing uh, faith on our capacity to deliver. And um, I think that um, the frameworks that we have, able, uh, we have been able to, to shape from the promotion of human rights, gender equality, regulation of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, I think all these frameworks have provided incredibly successful um, uh, you know, outcomes. Uh, let's pick one that is one of my favorites because it, it was extremely successful. The Montreal Protocol, for instance, uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, who uh, in the 1960s um, would have thought that the number of nuclear armed states would still be in the single digits. And this is not a victory because there would be none, there should be none, but at least we can count them with our fingers, which is already uh, something important. And, and I think that we cannot, we are not in the position of uh, losing the gains of the past 73 years. Uh, I think that uh, there is growing recognition at the same time that we're facing this crisis situation, this trust deficit. Uh, I think a growing recognition that we urgently need a stronger multilateral and rules-based system to protect our global commons. And, uh, and this is critical. And what are the global commons? Things that are so fundamental to our survival. Global commons such as the atmosphere, the one we all share, and that's why we're in trouble with climate change. The ocean, cyberspace, global goods, and the most important global goods are peace and security, precisely. So, as as already mentioned, I, I think we are uh, we have to face it. We are living a, a world of mul multiple crises. But at the same time, we see that our world, uh, world is more interconnected, more inter interdependent, and yet more polarized. So I, I think that um, we cannot ignore the fact that the crises that occur outside our own borders, such as the climate emergency or violent extremism, um, have enormous effects and put in risk uh, the neighboring countries, the neighborhood, 
you know, the close neighborhood, but also the, the, the faraway neighborhood. And um, we had a meeting with 45, the most important uh, uh, scientists working in the Amazon. And the message was very clear. If we destroy the Amazon, it's not only bad for Amazonian countries, it's bad for the non-Amazonian countries in Latin America, but it's bad for world climate and world biodiversity. So I think that uh, we have demonstrated also that uh, the line between inter and intrastate conflict uh, has been blurred, uh, and more and more so. And I think that we cannot afford to be indifferent. So I think, uh, I think this can be seen as, of course, a crisis, but also can be seen as an opportunity if we seize it and if we work together. And the greatest challenges we face uh, also offer you know, incredible opportunities to harness the creativity of youth. And we have seen that during these past days, during the Youth Climate Summit, the power of women uh, I have worked a lot in women in power during the last year. And uh, for example, our capability of transforming our own cities to make them more resilient, to transform our societies, our economies, the way our societies relate to nature and the environment, for example. And, uh, and I think that, and uh, I realize now that I have a, a little bit of a too long statement I would like to close, but. Uh, perhaps just to leave with you, just not this feeling of everything is bad, but we do have an opportunity here to work together. If, and we do have this opportunity if we, if we take seriously the deficits that we are facing. And perhaps I will summarize. There are more, but this is an indicative list. The first deficit in our multilateral system, uh, in my opinion, is the communication deficit. Um, we need to find ways to communicate our work better, to provide meaningful answers to those who have lost faith in the international system, and to push back against those who peddle misinformation. And this is happening a lot. We are leaving the world of fake news, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, I think perhaps the most important part of communication is something that I've been saying, and, and, and the Secretary General across the street has said, it's not only about communicating, it's not only about translating the work you do to the regular public, it is about listening. And I think that we need to listen more also. The second deficit is inclusion. And the UN, of course, we all know, the UN is an intergovernmental organization. So it is clear that states, member states, should be in the driving seat, no question. And, uh, and they, have be to, it, they, they need to be accountable for the decision they take, that we take. Um, but I think that we have to really come up with a clear blueprint, a clear um, agreement on how to include stakeholders in our conversations. It cannot be an ad hoc, in an ad hoc basis. It cannot be case by case. And I have experienced that last year a lot. Depends on the theme, depends if it's sensitive or not for country A or B, but we do need to have a predictable system to make sure that we give voice to local governments, civil society, women, indigenous peoples, youth organizations. They all must play their part. And not only as uh, the voices to uh, interpellar, to, 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 to criticize and question and, and, and demand, which is fair enough, but also that they have a co-responsibility in finding solutions that we need. So I, I think that we need uh, to establish more predictable means to include these voices. So that would be the, the, the deficit inclusion. And perhaps the third and last, there are many more in, around the room. I'm sure that you can come up with many more. But the third, I would say the delivery and the action deficit. And that's why this, this climate summit is called the, the Climate Action Summit. Um, and I think that we must uh, expand as much effort on implementation as we do on our deliberations. Uh, I think, for example, that if we want to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, and, and all of the rest, I think that fulfilling our promise to, to save succeeding generations from war, 
uh, needs really um, you know, to, to value multilateralism in its capacity to deliver for the people. So um, if we see the, the CTBT, for example, and very for perhaps just to end, uh, we just commemorated the 10th anniversary. Was it last week? Um, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So basically, um, we took that opportunity to to enhance public awareness, to enhance education, but also to call on the countries that were still waiting for them either to sign or to ratify. We're so close. We are so close, and this issue is so important because we know that after 1945, we have had more than 2,000 nuclear tests that have been conducted. So it is a real threat, and it is perhaps one of the, uh, when you say a successful treaty, we, we, it's easy, you say the, the, the protocol, uh, the, the Montreal Protocol. But now I hope that one day we, we should be able to, do, to say the CTBT also was a success, and, and we have to work towards, uh, towards that. And, and I think that we are also, we have to acknowledge, we are uh, living a very dangerous period in the nuclear part, um, marked by, by really tough tensions uh, among nuclear armed states, unfortunately. And uh, in my opinion, there is only one way to resolve these tensions and to keep our world in peace. And the only way is dialogue and diplomacy. So we need uh, a lot of that. Um, so um, I think that perhaps the CTBT can provide us with an opportunity that, to show that multilateralism, uh, multilateralism can work and can deliver. Uh, we do need that the convention uh, enters into force. And, uh, and that's why I appreciate so much uh, the work of the CTBTO and, and of Dr. Zerbo in trying to, to push in order to make it happen. So I think that we do have opportunities. Uh, uh, they're there. Uh, perhaps just next year, two processes that are, um, I'm sure, I, I really would like to invite you to take part, even in if uh, we have a new president across the street, but it's very important that we all engage in the, in the process uh, to the commemoration for the 75th anniversary of the United Nations next year, and uh, on the Beijing Plus 25 process on women's rights and women empowerment. I think that um, we, we really are in a juncture where we need to walk the talk. And I think the entire uh, choreography of this high level week is geared towards action and commitments. I'm, I'm, I have great hopes that this is what we're going to have after the end of the week. So we need to walk the talk, but something that I keep defending, we need to talk the talk because sometimes we are accused that the UN is only a talk shop. And, I, and I'm very proud to say yes, because we do have to talk to address and solve our issues. And dialogue is the strongest weapon we have as diplomats. That's what we have. Our weapons are words. And I do believe as a poet that words have a transformative power. So we also need to be very serious about talking the talk coming with uh, re-energized uh, narratives on the role and the replaceable role of multilateralism, of the role of dialogue, uh, on the role of peaceful solution of conflicts, on the role of diplomacy that is becoming so important. And diplomacy is not only about diplomats and governments, D diplomacy is also about civil society engagement. So I think that we can together uh, overcome indifference, uh, inertia, uh, with commitment and determination. And um, I, 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 I would just uh, make this invitation and I would just close with a quote. And I, I always forget who is uh, the, the owner of the quote, who, who is the author of the quote, but he said uh, it's a, a Nobel Peace Laureate, literature Nobel Peace Laureate from the United States. But he said that the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference, and we cannot be indifferent. Thank you.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to having more poets as president of the General Assembly in the future. Uh, poetic imagination is something which we in the international family could have more of rather than less. Uh, so uh, thank you, M Maria, for firstly being an activist uh, president of the General Assembly, because an activist uh, president of the General Assembly means uh, that you are asserting the voice of member states um, in a system which ultimately, um, as we know, has particular powers attributed to particular states, uh, given the nature of uh, what was agreed in the Charter 75 years ago. But also uh, to thank you for your passionate and continuing commitment to such important challenges as plastics and your passionate and important commitment as a strong woman president of the General Assembly uh, to Beijing Plus 25, which is uh, finance and women's empowerment. And we hope that you will remain engaged with these two big agendas into the future. Uh, our next uh, speaker today is uh, Dr. Lucina Serbo. I've known uh, Lucina for a long time. He's a highly effective head of the CTBO. The CTBO, for those of you not familiar with it, uh, since the past, since we put through the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, we now have 184 signature states. Uh, we've now have 168 ratification states. Well done, Lucino. You've got Thailand and Zimbabwe to ratify. Uh, so the number creeps up. It creeps up. Um, but eight states have yet to ratify. Uh, China, Egypt, India, Iran, Israel, North Korea, Pakistan, and the United States of America. It's undiplomatic to name them, so I won't. I just mentioned them. I didn't name them. Uh, but uh, if we're going to make international law potent, uh, it means that all member states, the United Nations, must put their shoulder to the wheel. Uh, the signature achievement, I believe, uh, of the CTBO has been the development uh, enhanced during Lucina's uh, uh, leadership of the organisation is the, the development of this comprehensive international monitoring system, the IMS. Uh, and the fact that you have three, 350, 347 uh, stations, monitoring facilities across the world, so that if anything happens, it is this independent system uh, which forms part of our multilateral family, which provides credible, immediate, technical advice as to what has happened and where. And for example, uh, all six uh, nuclear tests by North Korea have been accurately monitored and date, time and event given by this important institution through a mechanism in which we all have scientific trust. So Lucino, I look forward to hearing your remarks today and after you've uh, spoken, we'll then take to the front and take your questions from the audience. Lucino Zerbo. Thank you, uh, Kevin, my good friend. So let me thank the International Peace Institute for hosting uh, us today, together with uh, an effective 73rd uh, UNPGA, uh, Ms. Maria uh, Espinoza, whom I've known uh, from Ecuador, because Maria was part of the process to build two wonderful stations of our international monitoring system. Uh, facilities in the Galapagos Island. That wasn't an easy task. So, uh, and that basically put Ecuador as a, a country very close to my heart because when people ask about my achievement, uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, building those two stations in the Galapagos. But the only thing I forget to say is that I haven't taken leave in the Galapagos to enjoy because I wanted to make sure that people don't think or didn't think that I was going there for holiday, but I was just going to build the station and then come out. So I'm still looking forward to going for holidays in the Galapagos. But anyway, thank you. Uh, thanks to you all for being here. Um, one person who might complain is uh, uh, Keegan, because uh, Keegan often uh, is part of those who put together my uh, speeches and then they always talk about whether I use 10% or 50% or 60% of the speech. And I tell, uh, I tell them when I come in the room, when people talk before me, then your speech is over. Uh, because I try to use what they say and then make another speech. But uh, Keegan, I'm trying to, I'll try and be by 75% of your speech. And thank you for putting this together. But anyway, so we are in the world that is uh, difficult, uh, difficult especially for those like uh, me working in difficult tasks, like trying to put together 
uh, a framework, the political and technical framework for the entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Uh, you've heard that uh, despite securing 184 signature and uh, 168 ratification, the treaty is yet to enter into force because of eight remaining countries. And people wonder if the treaty will ever enter into force. And that's a question that many are asking me. Uh, I used to tell them if I didn't think I wouldn't be at the head of the CTBT. But now that Kevin said that I'm uh, running for the IEA, you might think that is because I think the CTBT will never enter into force. But no, it will. And it will because whether you are from the IEA perspective or any uh, nuclear non-proliferation arms control or disarmament, you should make sure that every aspect of those agreements are taken care of and so that we get the CTBT into force so that the NPT can be stronger and then the nuclear non-proliferation norm is even stronger uh, in our search to build a world free of nuclear weapon. And that's what we're trying to do. So, but the question we're asking ourselves today is uh, how can the international community come together to rebuild trust? Uh, Maria Fernandez has talked about the deficit of trust. And then it's true to rebuild trust and then to strengthen faith in multilateralism to confront the global challenges and thereby secure a more peaceful and, and prosperous world for the next generation. I mean, everybody's talking about the next generation today. And uh, we have the CTBT youth group with uh, nearly 800 uh, young uh, ladies and men who are advocating for this wonderful treaty. But uh, if we didn't bring the young generation will wonder, uh, because they think that this is our world, but with communication means Twitter, Instagram, and I mean, there's some that I can't even name. I mean, the, the youth are not the next generation anymore. I call them the current generation, but they're the one basically uh, dictating how we should work. Because if you're not on Twitter, you're not on Facebook, you have your kids at home, they come with things that you don't understand. So you have to let them basically lead and then give them your smartphone to download uh, an application for you and so forth so that you can follow what's happening in the world. And this is the world we're living in. And at the same time, the world is interconnected by all those communication means. And then we still think that we're not communicating well enough. And that's what Maria Fernandez said. But I'm going to come to a point that I've noticed myself in uh, traveling around trying to advocate for the CTBT. And you're absolutely right, uh, Ms. Uh, Espinoza. I think communication is a big problem. And I'm going to talk, when you take the arms control and non-proliferation framework, you go to one of the developing countries, Burkina Faso, to name it. You go and try to advocate for the CTBT, and then you talk to high-level officials, whether you are in the Comoros or in the Gambia or uh, in uh, you know, uh, Equatorial Guinea, you advocate for the CTBT and then you talk to the parliamentarian and then in the end they say, oh yeah, we're ready to ratify the prohibition treaty. Okay? Because in your discussion, they think you talk about the prohibition uh, treaty. People just don't make the difference between the CTBT, the NPT, the, the prohibition treaty, and then many of the international agreements that are uh, you know, on the making or that uh, are pending ratification or entering into force and so forth. We're not being fair to the developing world. And I'm saying we're not being fair because we're not communicating well enough. And we're not communicating well enough because simply we're bombarding the developing world with so many information at the same time on the same thing issue, which is non-proliferation and disarmament. You're taking from the Chemical Weapon Convention to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and then people are simply lost because they just don't have the resources like the, developing, the developed world to try and suck the information in a way where they can use it and then to make good sense of it. And that's a big problem. And I've seen it everywhere. I was, uh, you know, last week, I mean, uh, two weeks ago, uh, when we uh, were commemorating the 10th anniversary of the International Day Against Nuclear Testing, one ambassador came running to me and said, oh, Dr. Zerba, I'm so happy, you know, on the 25th, we're ratifying your treaty. And then I said, thank you, but you've ratified already. He said, no, but I'm talking about the prohibition treaty. <laughs> okay, so how do I deal with this? You know, and this is one of the big problems that I face myself. And then I think communication uh, should help deal with. But it's not only the smartphone, it's not only going, it's about working in a synergistic way where we link all aspects of non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, I'll give an example. Whether 
uh, you are from the IEA, the CTBT, or OPCW, and, or the UN. I think any head of organization in the UN and affiliated to the United Nations organization should be able to talk about aspects that are not necessarily his, but that are linked. If a head of the agency is going somewhere in a country that has not ratified the CTBT, he should be able to talk about the ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, because it is important. It is as important because linking it to his own issue, we can make a difference for the non-proliferation treaty. And that's what I say, effective communication that is needed in this field. So opportunities and risks in the current geopolitical landscape, communication is one of them, the importance of multilateralism in addressing global challenges. Ms. Fernandez talked about diplomacy. There is this concept that is not new, it's an old concept, science diplomacy, nuclear diplomacy, food diplomacy, or whatever, you name it. Why we say it's how we can bring science and technical aspect to drive the policy that we're trying to make. And that's something that we should focus on, bringing and bridging the gap between scientists and policy makers, and we don't do that well enough. We don't do it well enough because, I mean, we tend to live in our own cocoon where we think scientists as the ma are the master of ceremony, and then diplomats, you know, as I often say, but I can't say this anymore, Kevin, because I've, uh, people think that I've been in one of the diplomatic courts, they forget that I was a scientist, and 15 years ago, they didn't think I could be a diplomat. So. I'm now torn in between and I'm happy to be called a diplomat because I still have the trick to use my science background to uh, deal with the problem that they create. Because I often say, diplomats create a problem to try and solve it and try and to solving it, they create another problem to try and solve it and then they create another problem. And uh, I've dealt with uh, efficient diplomats who have also taught me one major thing, to be patient. Because then you don't hurry up in diplomacy. You have to wait for the right time to make your call, the right time to make things. But sometimes for a scientist it's difficult because I, we want to get things done just now and then we move on. And that's a difficulty that we have to deal with. But the only way to deal with is to bring science and policy makers to sit. When we talk about climate change and the threat from nuclear weapon today, those are the two existential threats that exist in this planet. But we can link them one way or another. When we talk about climate change, we should be able to bring that notion of what could be and what disaster uh, you know, a nuclear bomb could do to the climate change itself. There are experts who are writing that after a nuclear bomb, we can have uh, you know, a big change in terms of uh, you know, the temperature for a certain period of time. I mean, experts are talking about all those things that we should interconnect so that people see where we're coming from. And then we're not doing this well enough. And this is one of the biggest challenges that we will still face because we cannot, we cannot continue making policy without getting the solid ground that is coming from the science. I was listening today uh, to the young people in the climate action. I mean, of course, my dear friend Kevin and talk about activism. Activism is great, and activism is wonderful because it raises awareness. But after, after all, when we do the activism, what remains is probably what we didn't talk about because we're talking about advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. But we should bring the tangible fact to accompany the advocacy that we're doing. And that leads me to the example that I've been working on for the past 15 years, that's the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty itself. We mentioned the 300 plus facilities. I've seen no environment where science help drive policy as better as the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Here's an organization where to deal with this nuclear test issue, the 2000 nuclear tests and so that we talk about they brought scientists from all over the place. First, US and Russia, because the Soviet Union. Those are the two who dealt with nuclear weapons and then who could indeed deal with how to stop nuclear testing and then the science behind it. They brought them and then brought people as far as Senegal, young scientists to sit at a prototype in Virginia uh, to reflect on how we can bring science to see how best we can look for a nuclear test explosion. 
And it this work for 40 years and plus that I led to the opening of signature of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty because indeed we came to a point where we brought technologies that could indeed verify that no nuclear test explosion will go undetected. But guess what? We did the science, we brought the treaty, we opened the treaty for signature, and then the treaty is yet to enter into force, and we tend to forget sustaining this wonderful infrastructure and the wonderful science behind this treaty. And that's the difficulty that we're facing. We have an organization setting that is working to perfection. We have experts from around the world, the best in their field in Vienna, who are working day in and day out to contribute to your safety and security, because it's simply because of them that no nuclear test explosion would go unnoticed. They're making sure that you're safe in knowing what's happening in each corner of the planet, but also they're making sure that you get data that you can use for many other benefits, and then we can come to that in the discussion. And yet, we have a treaty, one of the organizations that people contribute the most to, because we have the organ one of the organizations that's the most adhered to treaty, but not only this, our assessed contribution is over 95%. People wonder, a treaty that is not enforced, and then an organization that is getting more than 95% of its contribution. You tell me how many UN and UN affiliated organizations get this type of assessed contribution? Very little. But then when I say this to in the, any of the developing country, people say, why? But they say, but uh, Lasina, you're working for an organization that belongs to the big players. And that's why they're paying the contribution because they need the information and they don't care about the treaty. And that's the biggest challenge that this organization is facing right now. Why having a strong infrastructure, a strong framework for the verification of the treaty, and not ratifying a treaty that could contribute to the whole NPT framework? You mentioned eight countries that I'm not going to mention. Kevin, I think uh, you are at the experience and age where you can do it without fear. But I still have a some a bit longer way to go, so I'll be careful about mentioning them. And, but anyway, we know who they are, and then we have to make sure that we bring them through the signs that drive the policy to tell them that, come on, you can't have this wonderful infrastructure, something that uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry called the greatest accomplishment of the modern world. That's the international monitoring system. But why the greatest accomplishment of the modern world is suffering the entering into force of the treaty that it's supposed to help verify. And that's a challenge that we have. But we are hopeful. We're hopeful because there's no other option. And that leads me to my last point, which is if we do not or if we cannot get the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty into force, what else can we do? What else can we do? The Prohibition Treaty is wonderful. What we want to achieve, it's a world free of nuclear weapon. But the CTBT is such a low hanging fruit that my perception is if we can't get this in our pocket, it will be hard to get any other treaty in arms control, non proliferation, and disarmament. So let's work in getting this. Let's combine the signs that the CTBT is showing wonderful enough to verify an important treaty. And let's show that this is the example where we bridge the gap between people who traditionally don't talk to each other, and then that if we don't get this treaty into force, it will be more and more difficult to move on progress in non-proliferation and disarmament. And that's what we need, and the CTBT is one of them. I know Kevin wants me to be short. I'll stop here, and then I'll take your question when we come. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Lucina, for those um, fine remarks. Uh, we are blessed uh, today to have with us um, a poet, uh, a scientist, um, and someone who names states. Um, <laughs> but both of you are international civil servants. Um, and both of you have become uh, international diplomats. And uh, the business of international diplomacy is to, is to move the dial. And that is harder to do than it is to say. So thank you both for moving the dial in your respective careers. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have about half an hour. Uh, if those of you who have key questions could begin to 
uh, wave at me. Uh, that would be useful. Um, and I might begin by um, posing a question to Maria, because you're now a little free of office, um, having uh, just having ceased being president of the 73rd General Assembly last week. On the question of, let's call it, international agreement, whether it's in peace and security, arms control, disarmament, nuclear non-proliferation, do you have any observations about the role of permanent representatives? By which I mean, I'm building partly on the Cena's excellent observation, that many host governments feel overwhelmed by the amount of incoming material from New York or from Geneva or from Vienna. And those who actually comprehend the complexity uh, and detail of these issues in capitals is a fairly narrow group. In which case, the proposition I wanted you to reflect on is do we need to, as it were, encourage a greater collective esprit de corps among permanent representatives uh, to become the brokers, more effective brokers of international agreements than may currently be the case. Uh, final point is, I've been around the international tracks quite a lot, and the standard uh, routine often is capitals blame posts and posts blame capitals. I'm sure it's only in Australia that's ever happened. Um, but basically, uh, those who are representing a country here at the United Nations will say, I'd love to help you, except my capital can't um, agree or within the time frame specified. And the capitals will say um, to those other governments, well, we'd love to, but we haven't got clear advice from our post. Now, what I'd like you to reflect on is if we are to build the machinery and the fabric of multilateral governance into the future, uh, is there a bigger role for our permanent representatives into the future uh, to begin to craft these agreements more proactively than is currently the case? Just push to your button. Yeah, certainly it's really not an easy start question, uh, Kevin, but uh, perhaps being you know very frank and, and open, it's not only on the disarmament instruments and negotiations. I think uh, that we are witnessing um, new developments in the way we take decisions at the multilateral level. And I think that we, we are facing um, uh, several difficulties. One is the discussion between consensus and uni unanimity. And, uh, and I think this is something that we haven't been able to solve nor address. A, we, we have, you know, we went through a very intense process um, coming up with the political declarations for the Universal Health Coverage Summit for the Sustainable Development uh, Goals Summit that is taking place, uh, place next week the agreement on the Samoa pathway review uh, for small island developing states, um, the Beijing plus 25 modalities, etc. you name it. it. Not only on disarmament, but the issue is now um, that there is no unanimity, even on the issues that we have agreed a long time ago. Uh, I remember when I was a negotiator myself, uh, and I have been, uh, like you, Kevin, uh, more than two decades on negotiations from different stands as a public servant, as a minister, uh, you know, as, as, as an advisor. But, you know, basically, when you said in a negotiation, this is agreed language, that was basically it. That was agreed language. And you could start from there. Now, when you say this is agreed language, not anymore. <laughs> And what we are doing is that we are reopening, you know, our commitments from the past. And sometimes what we are able to agree today, it's weaker or doesn't contemplate, you know, newer developments. And, and here, you know, there are several examples uh, of that. Things that are, you know, becoming very, very sensitive 
in that the impossibility of reaching unanimity. And basically, we have tried very creative ways. One of the creative ways is disassociation, explanation of position, explanation of vote. Uh, basically, I begged some of the member states saying, do not disassociate from all the text, but just to the part that you don't agree with. Um, we, we went through a very tough time at, with a global compact on migration. It's not a secret. And, uh, and sometimes the reasons are, you know, our shortage in communication. And, and, um, and Mr. Nasser is looking at, at his phone, but uh, he's, uh, you know, a top official from the global communications uh, uh, family at the UN. And, and I say, well, you know, we lost, in the case of, of migration and the compact, we lost the communication battle with misinformation and fake news. That, that's the truth. And then we had so many countries abstaining, so many countries going, you know, in paralysis, even domestically. Uh, there was a country that subscribed a compact on migration and had to resign as prime minister because he took a stand in favor of the rights of, 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 of people on the move or migrants. So I, I think that just to make my answer shorter, that we, we, we need to, to rethink the decision-making processes in general. Uh, we need to, to understand if consensus means unanimity, and also if our system, the multilateral system, is well equipped to deal with dissent. And here I think that we have to learn better how to deal with dissent. This has been my experience this year. And, um, and because the world is, the, the, I mean, we cannot change the world. And at some point, a country you know, doesn't have uh, climate change as a priority, or is terrified by the, the denuclearization processes and the instruments, and, um, you know, they, and they, they are not playing that game, they're, you know, et cetera. And we have to be wiser you know, to deal with dissent. And this disconnect between capitals and New York, uh, permanent representatives and, the, and, and uh, what is happening at home, yes, there is a disconnect. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to tell if it's hap it happens here or it's happening there. But at the end of the day, uh, yeah, it is an obstacle for decision making. I think um, to reflect on that momentarily, for example, in the G20 process, I remember during the financial crisis a decade ago, my point about permanent representatives is this. It was actually a Sherpa process at the officials level, which actually made it work. Um, you actually need a group of people who are across the politics and the policy of what is being proposed in order to become the brokering agents for agreement. Your point, obviously, about disinformation, and I saw what happened with a compact, is absolutely valid, because that undermines your domestic constituencies back home. But I wonder whether our permanent uh, representative uh, class, for want of a better term, have a new set of responsibilities, given all the pressures being pushed down against the existing multilateral framework to unravel what we've agreed, let alone to push it forward. Now, Lucina, um, let's just assume you are God tomorrow. Uh, and you have uh, an opportunity uh, to take, let's call it the family of institutions, the uh, CTBO, the IAA, and the MPT, uh, and without, as it were, utopian redesign of those um, instruments, what can we be doing better uh, in the overall cause of nonproliferation? Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm hesitating because I'm a candidate for the IEA, but let me say it anyway, since you say that I have to th picture myself as God, which I will never be, but uh, let's picture myself as somebody who is looking from above. Um, we not, not only CTBT, NPT, IEA, I think the whole international framework and multilateral diplomacy, there's a lack of synergy. 
within the international organization. And I'll give one simple example. If you take how we approach technical cooperation in the developing world. Here's, for instance, Africa and Latin America and the developing world are in demand of nuclear energy. We have a technical cooperation framework that goes in a world where the culture of safety and security that normally accompany the need for nuclear energy is not there. But yet, the technical cooperation will focus on radiotherapy, cancer therapy, agriculture, food security, water, and those aspects without tapping the security and safety issue that goes with, because they will come at a later stage. So we're bombarding people with information on how to access nuclear energy, nuclear medicine, and food conservation, and so forth. And then three or six months later, somebody come and then talk about radiation protection, talks about security and safety of nuclear power plants. And then those who are sitting there cannot link the security and safety culture that goes with the need of nuclear energy because they're focusing on medical access to cancer, ter access to cancer therapy and radiotherapy and so forth. They don't connect the dots. And then six months later, I come and then I say, I want you to ratify the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. They focus on the word nuclear. And then they say, okay, where am I? But are you working for the IEA? No. And then the guy, he takes time to listen. And then when you go, he's lost. He doesn't know if he has to focus on his immediate need, which is medical, cancer therapy, and so forth. And then you want him to start the process that is a complete legal framework to bring the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty into force. What I'm saying, we should offer a platform where all those international organizations will address the developing world separately. And I'll take one example, another example. Coming for the NPT Review Conference, I was invited as a keynote speaker in, uh, in one of the meetings in Africa to try and promote and explain what the review conference, the NPT review conference is all about. There were 67 diplomats in the room. And then after my keynote, it was in uh, one part of Africa, and then I asked, who among you will be going to the review conference in Geneva? There was none. So this is sponsored by maybe EU or sponsored by any you know, Western country to try and help the developing world to cope with the issue of non-proliferation and disarmament. And yet, we're talking to people who will never have that opportunity to be present where the discussion that their training for two days should feed, they're not there because somebody else from the country is going there. So how effective are we? So yes, the permanent representative should be brokers, but they should be given the tools to the work that they have to do. You cannot have a permanent representation where you have two, three people who have to cover a myriad of things in, in New York here, and then they can't even cope with it because they can't be everywhere, and then they don't know how to prioritize or reprioritize things that are important to them, their region, or their country. I think that's a big problem. And do, I'm, I can see a hand at the back there. So why don't I take that question, and, um, and then I'll come back, and, and I'll see a question here too. I think uh, we'll bring a microphone around. Uh, it's here, uh, Kevin. Thank you. Richard Jordan uh, from the Blue Community Consortium. Um, uh, Madam President, there is a resolution of the General Assembly called or entitled the International Day of Multilateralism and Diplomacy for Peace. Could the um, General Assembly perhaps utilize that resolution as a day for education and dialogue among permanent representatives, building on Kevin's uh, very fine uh, introduction on, the, on this uh, uh, idea. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you so much, because sometimes uh, it's great to hear that people that are, do not live across the street, they, they know their resolutions you know, by heart. And, uh, thank you for acknowledging uh, that resolution who established uh, the International Day on Multilateralism and Diplomacy for Peace. So we, we have made full use of that new resolution. 
uh, this year we, we had a, a high level discussion that I think it was extremely fruitful. Uh, just prior to the formal uh, General Assembly discussion, we had a very fruitful um, informal debate uh, with the support of the IPI precisely. I don't know if you remember that, Kevin. With full house, it was lunchtime. No, Over here. No mm. lunch provided. And I said, well, no one is going to come. It's going to be empty. But we were able to have a packed room uh, for a conversation on multilateralism. I, th I take your point that we should be perhaps more creative. This year, it was the, the ground breaking the first time. And, uh, and I think that we should, we should use that for awareness raising, for education, to bring the discussion to the model UN exercises worldwide, young people. There is, uh, we can use, make full use of that resolution. I think it's very, very powerful. And uh, this year, even before the resolution, uh, we were able to organize two events to bring uh, the heads of all main organs of the UN to sit down together and discuss synergies, coordination. The last one was on the 12th, 12th of September, across the street. I don't know if you were there, but it was extremely interesting. Um, Secretary General, President of ECOSOC, President of Security Council, President of the GA. Unfortunately, we just we missed the President of the International Court of Justice. Last minute, he wasn't able to come from The Hague, but you, we did it for the first time. I did it twice, actually, and I really highly recommended my successor, uh, um, President Tijani Mohamed Bande, to continue with the tradition. Conversation here, but conversation outside the walls of the UN are much needed. UN 75th anniversary, golden opportunity to do that. And thank you. It's interesting. Um, it goes back to one of your earlier remarks, uh, Maria, about the importance of continuing to talk the talk uh, of multilateralism. Because I worry in the international community that we are talking about it less. And therefore, the responsibility which we collectively share through our voices is to say, Repeatedly, this is the normal way in which we resolve problems and address the challenges of the future, rather than other means. So talking the talk, hence the value of the forums you've convened during your presidency. Question at the back, sir. Sorry. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me now. Uh, Wasim Mir from the uh, United Nations Foundation. Thanks to IPI for organizing the event. First, a question to uh, Madam ex-president. Uh, I mean, she's been one of the most compelling speakers and most, one of the most engaging speakers I've seen as president of the General Assembly, yet she highlighted engagement and communications being one of the big challenges for multilateralism. So in your perspective, what's, what have you done over the last year that you've felt really has worked in terms of engaging with the public? And what have you found, now that you're not in the UN system, what have you found to be the real barriers to getting through to the general public on the ground. Just a follow-up question to uh, Dr. Zabo. Again, you're, you've got a scientific background. And when I was growing up, one of the things in terms of communications, I always remember that when a scientist said something, we believed them. It was seen as you know, being neutral, being, uh, being the truth. And we can then base a discussion on it and come to an agreement. That no longer seems to be true. So I don't know whether you'd uh, like to offer some perspectives from a scientific perspective how scientists can better get their message across to the public. Thank you. Why don't we take you first, uh, Lucina, and then uh, Maria. So how, how scientists can get uh, the message across, you know, you, uh, I'm tempted to say, come and see how the CTBT worked for the past a few years and then you will see how we managed to get our message across. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is uh, I've never seen in a sh small place such a gathering of talented scientists trying to make a difference and then changing why policymakers felt was the easiest way to go or the most difficult way to go. And uh, putting our message across, I'll give you one specific example which will uh, 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 
show the difference between scientists and, uh, and diplomats. We're trying to bring one of our technology called the infrasound technology into operation. For years, we couldn't. And uh, at the same time, we had people in the Middle East who felt that the detection threshold of our international monitoring system wasn't working, wasn't that effective. That was a perception. And then, as a scientist, that was about 10 years ago, I said, maybe we need an experiment there to blow 80 tons of explosives to see how far we can listen to them and then see how we can calibrate this technology before we bring it into operation. But how do you do this type of experiment in the Middle East? Do you do it in Egypt? Do you do it in Jordan? Do you do it in Israel? And uh, I came up knowing how diplomats work. We send a note verbal and asking them uh, who is ready to carry out this type of experiment in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is precise and vague enough for people to not know or to know where it is. So whoever respond will be the winner of that experiment. And Israel was the only country to respond. And then we call upon experts to come and then do that experiment there. And then we blew 80 ton, 150 tons of explosive. And nobody could say no, because if Egypt or Jordan or uh, Tunisia or whatever had responded, we'll do it there. One country, we did the explosive, and we detected the event from Mongolia Tunisia, 6,000 kilometers away, we detected. It helped us to calibrate. Then the infrasound technology where diplomats had doubt, policymakers, that this should come into operation because of A, B, C, D, realized, oh, that's something new and something interesting. And today, for your information, infrasound is one of the most adhered to and most, I would say, impressive technology of the city. But all are good. But the infrasound help us to go tens of ton in terms of detection threshold and then help calibrate the international monitoring system to make sure today that no nuclear test explosion goes undetected. This is how you pass your message across. With facts, with reality, where you can tell policymakers this is how it is and this is how we can help make a difference. And this is what we try to do at the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Facts, reality, and an intelligent use of media drama. Well done. <laughs> the, um, and over to you, Marie, on the other question. So, um, I, I think it, it, it very much was uh, regarding the theme of last session. You know, when you are elected president, you have to select a theme for the year session. And um, I did a lot of consultation, spoke with a lot of member states, et cetera. And the phrase for last year was making the UN relevant for all. And, um, and you know, we put all the energy and, and, and the thinking and the work of, of the presidency and, and my cabinet uh, to make sure that we were able to connect with people, to translate, I think that the UN needs to do a lot of translation work, but not on the official languages, I'm, I'm not referring to the interpretation, but to translate how multilateralism operates and touches and transforms the lives of people. So the talk shop produces norms and policies that affect and transform the life of people on the ground. And um, wherever I traveled, you know, the official part, and then I said, I need to go to a university to meet with a youth group, wherever they are, uh, women's, uh, women's groups, uh, civil society people, academia. And, and I think that if we multiply uh, that by having spokespersons, I kept saying ambassadors across the street, you should all be uh, spokespersons for multilateralism and the UN. And every time I said, do you know, you know, to young people or high school uh, students, you know that the UN provides food for 90 million people every day. Nine zero, nine zero million, 90 million people. You know that the UN provides 50% of the vaccines for children worldwide. You know that the organization that arrives you know, in two, three, or four hours after a disaster happened, 
a major earthquake, a tsunami, or whatever, is the UN in our humanitarian architecture. So we do touch the lives of people, and, and I think that uh, you know, when people think about the UN, and we, we did some focus groups uh, exercises, it's amazing. You, you show people a flag of the UN. They smile, they like the UN, they immediately connect with the logo. And when you ask them, can you explain what the UN does? You know, they look at you just like, you know, empty look, and they, after little time, they, they for example, they mention UNICEF. That, it comes to mind, UNICEF, children. Uh, but there is no knowledge nor understanding of the whole elephant of the United Nations. So I think that uh, we, we do need to do a better work, not only of communication, but of listening and of translation uh, as well. But I think the best public relations uh, uh, thing that we can do is uh, keep our word, meaning implement our agreements. And look, for example, this year we broke a record on, on resolutions at the General Assembly. We passed 343, 343 resolutions. And I kept saying you know, to my brothers and sisters, the permanent representatives, please go back and check the resolutions that we, you have adopted this session and make sure that we make sense of what we, are, you know, we agreed upon and let's go back and see how these are useful to improve our domestic policies at home, to improve our legal frameworks, to improve the way we deliver on X or Y. And that is why also the Sustainable Development Goals are so powerful. It, it is our survival kit of the 21st century, and we need to, to deliver and, and, and implement. I, I hope that I responded that question, but basically, I, I think that it is an ongoing effort, and, uh, and we should keep repeating ourselves. We need to make the UN relevant for all. Now we've got uh, time for one more question, three or four minutes. Quick question up the back. I'm sorry there's one up the back. Thank you. Good and then you, quickly here, and then we need to uh, wind up. Good to see you again also back. Maher Nasser from the Department of Global Communications. I mean, you touched on a core point about communications. The world of communication today is different than it was, and it keeps changing at a pace that we cannot keep up with. If you look at social media and new technologies, the, the most things that are, go viral other than pictures of cats, <laughs> are messages of hate and anger and that promote fear. And of course, the ability to respond in real time to those is beyond the capacity of any communicator or even head of agency or diplomats. And I think this is when we talk about multi-stakeholders and multilateral. the new kind of multilateralism needs to bring in the new stakeholders of the big tech companies who in a way are much more powerful in, in, than most governments. The capital, if you add the capitalization of the five biggest companies in the US, that's more than the GDP of all countries in Africa. So when you talk about picking up the pieces multilateralism, uh, is there a need for new multilateralism that goes beyond the governments? I mean, maybe this is where now young people and people around the world, they see that the world today is beyond the capacity of just governments. And when we talk about the SDGs, we say that the SDGs cannot be achieved by the governments. We have to bring in the society, community, industry, education, and more, and, 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 and so on and so forth. And on the other extreme, how other than the hatred and, 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 and anger that that campaign uh, stifled the global compact, we see what one little girl did. Greta, who spoke today in the General Assembly a year ago, she was one person striking in front of the Swedish parliament. On Friday, there were four million people. And young people are now demanding and re requesting us, the older generation, to deliver on what they are promising. So on the other side, it can also serve as a, pub as, as a message of, of hope and a message of driving politicians to do the right thing. And I'm going to ask the impossible question, which is 60 seconds from each of you to conclude, because <laughs> our time is up. Firstly, the Sina, then uh, then Maria, and then I'll wind up. Yeah, but let me thank uh, Maher Nasser for for being here because uh, you know across the street there is a lot happening, so uh, you know I really appreciate your being here. He was the uh, the acting Under Secretary for Global Communications for a while, and he's a top 
top top of the global communications across the street. So yeah, I appreciate you being here. Maria is used to 60 seconds, so. <laughs> Lucina first, it's okay, it's okay. I'm just kidding, just kidding. No, uh, you know, thank you. You mentioned uh, uh, social communication is different today than uh, I mean 20 or even 10 years ago. And I fully agree. But to use my 60 second, I want to, to say one thing that could make a difference in multilateral diplomacy. Be it for government or be it for head of organization, I think one critical issue is to not come and then work thinking about a second or a third term. They should allow people to work freely without thinking about whether they will be re-elected. And that will give them the freedom and the trust to achieve, rather than thinking, if I do this, it will upset this part or this corner of the world, and then you'll think about your second term. That's one of the difficulty that I see in many international organizations. I mean, that doesn't happen to me anyway, because you know, I often say that I can go back and grow potatoes in Burkina Faso, so it makes life easy for me. But we have to make sure we allow people to work freely and then deliver. Deliver for a time, because don't think that you're there for two, three, four, or whatever term. You're there for the period you elected, and then you deliver. Like a UNPGA know that she's there or he's there for one year, and then he has one year to deliver. That should be the same for in all multilateral uh, institutions. Thank you, Lucina. 98 seconds for you. Over, over to you, uh, Maria. Oh, my goodness. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know, perhaps um, just a, a, final, a final call to say that multilateralism is about global leadership. Uh, it is about collective responsibility, uh, and it, it is uh, about collective action as well. And, uh, and uh, for an efficient, accountable, relevant multilateral system with the U United Nations at the core, uh, basically, uh, basically, we need a uh, whole of society ownership of the work we do, and and I think that that's perhaps one of the challenges we face. We need you all. We need things, th think tanks like the IPI. We need academia, the scientific community. We need social movements to the to be part of the equation. Thank you very much, and um, it's been a great day today. Multilateralism. To take that last question. If I was to take a focus group to my original uh, district constituency electorate in Australia and ask them what multilateralism was, uh, they wouldn't have a clue. Um, maybe we need to think about the way in which we communicate. Maybe it's working together. Maybe it's working together as governments, as corporations, and as peoples across the world to achieve common results. In other words, let's find language which resonates with the constituency which ultimately pays the taxes which keeps this whole thing flowing. Today, um, and one final advertisement for the IPI, for the future of multilateralism, a couple of years ago, uh, I chaired a commission here called the Independent Commission on Multilateralism. All of its reports are online. On the, it's called UN 2030, examining most of the questions we've been discussing today, a two-year-long exercise, um, and in uh, multiple reports have a look at it as we consider the future of this important institution. But today, here at the IPI, we've had science, uh, we've had poetry, uh, we've had diplomacy, and you only get the three of them here at the International Peace Institute. Please th thank our two contributors today. <laughs> <laughs>